Anytime. Hey, Lou, thanks a bunch. I'm here with Terry Bruner. You might know his name from a lot of different endeavors over the years here in the state of New Mexico, from the USDA, from a lot of other federal things, even the mayoral last couple of mayoral runs here. Terry's been around it. He's been around politics a long time at the federal level. And we're very glad he's with us today to talk about a report he and his group have out about infrastructure needs in the rural parts of our state. Uh, I'm going to be referring to the report itself as Terry and I talk here. So the link to it's going to be in the thread below. If you'd like to read along uh, in the different sections we're going to be talking about here, I would encourage you to do so. Whether you can do it today or tomorrow or the next week, I would encourage you to do so whenever you can. I consider this a very important piece of information that we have been needing to have for a long time. So Terry, thank you very much. Tell us about the group, the name, what it's about, who funds you folks, and what the plan was going into this uh, report. So our group is called Pivotal New Mexico. We're a nonprofit located in Albi. Really is to help uh, New Mexico organizations get the funding they need to advance the projects that are important to their groups. Um, so uh, we've been ex in existence for a few years, funded by several different New Mexico and out-of-state foundations, and also through contract work that we do with governments and, uh, and nonprofits. And we were asked by the legislature uh, last year to compile a report on New Mexico's rural infrastructure needs in the areas of broadband, electric, sewer, and water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's cut these uh, just a little bit finer here. I want to—I don't want to swing back to those four issue areas here, but interestingly, what the theme that really comes out in this report is there's a lot of issues here: deferred maintenance issues, the, the fact that we have not invested in our infrastructure for too long. Now we're playing catch up, and I realize a lot of folks are probably going to get hung up on the costs of these things. <laughs> so I wanna start somewhere philosophically on this. It, it really is a situation that we can either pay to catch up or we can just pay forever to never catch up, isn't it? it now is the time to strike, it seems to me. That's the, this is what the report is saying. Yeah, you, you have the money in the bank now to make a giant mm -hmm. impact on, on the, the deficit we have in a sense in broadband and, and water and, and sewer. So um, yeah, you'll never quite always catch up um, because, you know, things need to be repaired and everything, but we have, have not been strategically um, uh, on top of taking care of all these needs um, in the past decade or so. So we do we have a bit of a lag. Mm -hmm. let's, talk about it. let's talk about broadband. That's one of the four issues, er, issue areas there, and we could take an hour on this. <laughs> it's so complicated. But give me your top line assessment from the report about what's missing for uh, New Mexicans here when it comes to infrastructure and being connected to the world and what it's costing us in the report. Well, you know, as you know, New Mexico's got the lowest speeds in the nation and, and some of the worst coverage. Um, so, you know, even in the areas that we have coverage, the, the, the speeds aren't uh, up to standard na nationwide. So um, we really lack a strategic way of looking at broadband, um, similar to like how you look at a highway system where, you know, certain highways need improvements because a lot of people travel on them and those are the priority. The same thing is true with broadband. We really have to focus on where the high needs are and then, mm -hmm. and then have a strategy to leverage all the different funding that's out there to complete as many projects as possible. And, and that's what we've been doing in the past is one-offs and there hasn't really been a strategy behind it. And, mm -hmm. and throughout our document, we really um, talk about that need for planning and, and um, a strategic outlook on how you're gonna get these needs funded. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you ended with that word funded because again, the focus of the report is helping communities and municipalities find a way to fund, not just the, their needs, but to fund Terry as well, the kind of expertise you need. We have a lot of situations where we're using volunteer help <laughs> for water yeah. projects and infrastructure projects. That's got to end. It's got to be professional, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, 67% of our state's water systems have less than 500 users. And a lot of those systems are 40 household systems that are literally a mom and pop operation with mm -hmm. mom and pop running the water system. And, you know, we lack a number, the number of, of water managers we need and engineers. I mean, we say in the report, there really ought to be an effort to train more water engineers at our universities or attract mm -hmm. engineering firms from out of state because you know they there's so much work at the moment to be done. 
we don't have nearly the number of professional service people to work on deploying uh, 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 the resources that we need to mm -hmm. fix up these systems. Mm -hmm. Let me bounce back to uh, broadband for a quick sec. Yeah, I've, I've, my fault, they're taking us off to water. I'm gonna hold water for you for a quick second. You're calling for a group to, and you mentioned this, I wanna get a little more detail, a group to actually oversee the needs of the entire state when it comes to broadband infrastructure. I'm going to assume that also means someone's going to have to be tasked to collate what we have now. Am I am I correct on that before we can start yeah. to make plans for the future? We, we've done some decent planning as a state to catalog what we have, mm -hmm. um, but we really don't have a strategy uh, system by system, community by community for moving forward and and how to get that done. I think our, our current governor is getting there and, and mm -hmm. she's appointed some infrastructure people to help with this that I think is a real great move. But, you know, you have issues out there like right away issues. That's a little bit of an obscure part of the law. But, uh, you know, when I was a federal executive, we had broadband projects in the Navajo Nation held up for two years on, an, on, a, on a, a right away issue. And we recommend a right away commission to navigate those disputes. Uh -huh. So that okay. you don't end up deploying $10 million for a broadband system that never gets built because of a right, right away system. But there's things like that that we can chip away at to make the process go a little faster. Interesting. Um, how about things like uh, what it costs to have rural broadband infrastructure? In the report, it makes an interesting case that if you... Dollar, you're going to get back a bunch more than that down the road within 20 years. I think that would be news to most people when it comes to investment. Well, that the you mean that the investment pays itself off in the long run, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, all of the stuff we talk about in infrastructure is are really the building blocks behind a successful educational system, public health system, you know, economy, all those types of things. When you're not deploying these uh, these needs at the at the rate you ought to, you're you're taking away from the potential to have that growth. Um, but if you if you uh, configure these systems in a smart fashion, you're gonna reap a return on them. Hold on a quick sec, T and the guys at the studio, I'm having a little trouble with my audio over here for some reason. Just give me just a quick sec. I'm not quite sure why that is. Terry, can you say a couple of words real quick? Yeah, can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Sorry, okay. sorry about that. Not quite sure what was going on there. Um, let's kick over to water here real quick. This is a big issue for us here at New Mexico PBS. We've been following, obviously, a lot of things when it comes to water, meaning, you know, polluting of water in different ways. But the report points out, and let's get back to how water is managed here. Something needs to come together. And, and tell us about what the report is recommending in, on that front. Yeah, I, I think um, what, we, what we're recommending on a couple of fronts are, you know, more planning and technical assistance. So, mm -hmm. you know, more expertise out in the field from state agencies to help water managers. You know, this, the Environment Department has three people that staff a telephone line uh, for people to call in with water difficulty. I mean, mm -hmm. they reported us that they could use three or four times that number of staff just to manage all those calls. Um, so that, you know, and we hear consistently from water systems that they've broken down and there's no one to help them. So, you know, really there's this troubleshooting and problem solving thing we need to get to where we're helping people manage these systems. We ought to think about regionalization of systems that cannot perform on their own. Um, so if you have a bunch of small systems, they can use water more efficiently if they team up. So uh, there should be some advocacy on that front from the state government. And um, as well, like we keep saying, there ought to be some sort of system to prioritize which projects need funding based on maybe where they are in your water supply map or how right. many people they serve, that, that those get to the front of the line because they're more crucial. We don't really do that. It's kind of, you know, everybody fight for themselves kind of thing, which mm -hmm. isn't a great way to plan it out. And there are some, you have some recommendations that some other states have gotten their arms around that very issue you're talking about. T touch on that a little bit more, that regional approach you're describing. Yeah. I mean, the state of Colorado has a good system for, uh, for their water funding, where they have only two agencies that deal with water funding for local communities. We have six or eight different ones that communities have to navigate. And then they have, a, they have Colorado di divided up into regions, and they have staff in every region 
that get to know that area and help develop and work on projects. So there's this local state government presence that's there when communities need them. And, and that's a real logical way to do it. Um, it's a great way to be out in the field monitoring what's happening on infrastructure. We have a similar system with the way we do highways. We have regional transportation and highway districts because that local uh, presence by the state is important. We should do the same on water and broadband. Mm -hmm. What's the downside to the system we have now? What, what's going on that, that begs for this sort of uh, renewed approach when it comes to water? Well, I think the problem that we've had is after years of austerity and trimming government, we literally don't have enough people working in government to deal with the, the volume of infrastructure needs that we have. So it's time to staff up or restructure government in such a way that you can deploy these, these resources more efficiently. I mean, it, it, it's kind of crazy that a small community water system, if they need a repair, has six or eight different state agencies they can call. You know, why not have one agency or two? The state of Utah, the state of Montana, Colorado, Oregon, they have one or two agencies that deal with this. For some reason, we've dispersed it out throughout agencies and made it pretty difficult for people to navigate. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting when you look at the map, Terry, in your report, the eastern part of our state in this water part, water bit of the report really shows up quite a bit. Those, those counties that hug, uh, you know, basically from Roosevelt County going north. Curry County, go, you know, all that kind of thing. What's going on in the eastern part of our states that makes water management so difficult? Is, is it something unique to that part of the state? Well, I, I mean, each region of the state kind of has its own traditions, um, you know, in and how they've grown as water systems and such. You know, you have some private providers out on the east side of the state, which is a little different from mm -hmm. other parts of the state. And then you have a dwindling population, which affects the ability to manage a water system. The fewer users you have in a system, the less people are paying bills and less money you have. So um, those parts of the state have tr traditionally had municipal systems. And then not a lot of the small systems that are mutual domestic or mom and pop systems, as I would call them, that you see in northern New Mexico, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's really been more of a municipal function in that part of the state. So that's why you see it centered and clustered around towns like Clayton and Texaco and, and places like that. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, you know, we're talking a lot of money here. And obviously your group is designed to help folks find that money. How bad is the water infrastructure generally in New Mexico? We had a very poor place, sort of just needs a little help. Or how should folks consider where we are in water infrastructure currently? Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's a, like a lot of stuff in New Mexico. We have a lot of uh, systems that are performing adequately. We have a lot that are not performing at all um, where they should be, and and maybe they're um, having a lot of difficulty. So, um, you know, that's not unique around the nation in a sense, um, mm -hmm. but uh, but definitely when you think about tribal systems, colonial systems down in the southern part of the state, um, some of our really rural spots. Um, or you know, uh, little communities in northern New Mexico, they're having trouble um, because one of the problems is. Concrete costs money and um, treating arsenic and contaminants in the water costs money. And as keep up with EPA standards, these systems have to get more and more sophisticated. So a small system that might have performed for 50 years doing just fine is suddenly right. finding they have to really ramp up. And that's a struggle. You know, it's interesting. We see these giant water tanks. We don't think about their life cycle. You know, what I mean? it's just re reclaiming a water tank is no small deal. So that's that would be just a stark example. Um, let's take it to another part of the report. Uh, climate change, cyber attacks and extreme weather. 50 billion you're reporting to protect against droughts, heat, flood, wildfires and other uh, weatherization. The time is now for that, isn't it? Especially when you consider wildfires. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, that's the other side of this is the emergency side of it. You know, uh, water, you know, we need drinking water. We need mm -hmm. uh, sewer treatment that prevents water contamination. We need broadband when there's a public emergency. So so nailing those down are really important. Um, I don't believe our, our state emergency management agency has a lot of flexible funding when those things come about. Mm -hmm. um, so we really need to think uh, in terms of what we do in case of emergency. You've seen with cyber attacks recently that they can bring down a whole water system or right. a wastewater system or an entire our most populous county in the state. 
at a cyber attack. And these are the type of things that we need to get ahead of rather than respond to from behind and after they happen. So yeah, I mean, that's a whole nother level of funding and work that has to really be done. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the legislature. Obviously, they're going to have a, a pretty heavy hand in how this all works out. Uh, Governor Lujan Grisham has announced that former Albuquerque mayor, someone you know well, Marty Chavez, is now the infrastructure czar of a sorts. I I'm curious to your opinion on the need for that. Is that the appropriate way to go to have one person at the top of it sort of overseeing or is, or is there a better way or what's your sense of it so far? Well, what we call for is really kind of having a committee led by the, the governor's office that, that is constituted of the, um, that consists of the, the heads of agencies to talk about infrastructure. But mm -hmm. given that we're in this kind of emergency or last, you know, uh, rapid deployment of infrastructure funds, I think um, the governor's assembled kind of an all-star team to, to come in and help. So, you know, nobody knows municipal infrastructure better than Mayor Chavez. And, you know, they've got Mike Hammond, the former director of the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, mm -hmm. Bianca Ortiz Wertheim, who's Senator Udall's former chief of staff. They've got a new broadband director from the state of Illinois. I, I think the governor has been wise to bring in these experts to, to help deploy these funds. But in the long term, really um, what we call for is um, is for the executive of the state, the governor, to convene a group that's meeting on a regular ba basis to hack out all the different infrastructure issues we have. That would make sense, it would seem to me. Um, one issue that's in the report that I found really fascinating is about the state's anti-donation clause. And the reason for that is there's a lot of money being, you know, exposed, you know, you're talking about here in this report, I'm talking a lot of money. And the anti-donation clause has been a real controversy about how one gets funds moving back and forth. Um, it, it, do me a favor, it, it, tell the folks about the Colorado situation you referenced in the report. And then I'd like to hear your opinion about where we could possibly go with the anti-donation clause that could make some of this a little bit easier for municipalities. Yeah, I mean, what we say is that the anti-donation clause really has a chilling effect on infrastructure. We see that especially in the area of broadband. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, under the anti-donation clause, you can only uh, distribute state monies through a state entity. Um, and so you can't contribute to a private broadband system. You can't contribute in some cases to various types of municipal systems because they're, you know, could be run by a private broadband system. And, and what the state of Colorado has done to get around that is talk about public need and, and make provisions within their clause to say, if there's a demonstrated public need, for something like broadband, then you should be able to deploy that infrastructure funding. But you know, the state of New Mexico has uh, created a couple of broadband funds that they had difficulty deploying because they simply couldn't give it to the people that run broadband systems. Right. And so you end up trying to finagle a way to get that money out the door that's slow, awkward, and doesn't really meet the need. So um, the other difficulty we have with the anti-donation clause is when you change it, it's a constitutional amendment that has to go to a vote. So, so the state really needs to get on what they're gonna do about it because any type of change to that's gonna take a couple of years. Right. Um, but it, but uh, you know what I'm very worried about and our partners in writing this report are worried about is, is this federal money coming down along with state money and just not being able to use it like we mm -hmm. should. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the lines here that really caught my eye and should catch anybody's eye if they read this report, and I'm, again, I'm going to encourage our viewers to do so. We'll have a link in the in the thread below. That there was a the business roundtable in an infrastructure infrastructure study found that for every dollar invested in infrastructure, delivers three dollars and seventy cents in economic growth over twenty years when factoring in household income and other economic indicators. That to me, Terry, seems like you know. If you're going to think long term, how do you pass that kind of how do you pass that up? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, I, it's pretty clear. Yeah, I don't know how we pass it up. I mean, <laughs> we're not even talking about the fact that when you do an infrastructure project, you're hiring people to do the construction. They're buying supplies in the local community. Right. Um, you know, you're doing all sorts of good. And and I think the problem is, is infrastructure is just not a sexy topic and it's not forefront on people's minds. And so it often gets, uh, you know, left behind. And, and it's more often than not these days, a state by state competition. You know, companies want to locate in a place where 
they have this infrastructure in place. I mean, we talked to business owners across the state that said our lack of broadband is inhibiting their growth as a business. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, if we want economic development, we got to have broadband that's competitive. And right now, we are the least competitive state with our broadband. Yeah, it really is. It really is amazing. I, I'm, I'm, I go back to Mayor Chavez in the in the a challenge he's going to have and his team, his all star team, as you as you call them. And that is how to set priorities and who gets in first. And I'm interested in how Colorado did it with the Colorado Together We Build report. They prioritize projects using three criteria, one immediate two enduring, and three equitable. That makes a lot of sense to me when you think about it from a New Mexico lens. How, how does that strike you? Yeah, we, we like that. And then, you know, a couple other states like Oregon had uh, early in the recovery back in early 2020 uh, put out principles behind how they would spend their recovery funds. And they addressed mm -hmm. things like equity or preparedness or whatever. And, and I think we should do the same thing because um, what's happening is the people that get funded are the, the ones that know how to work the system, right? And and they have an engineering firm, or they you know they spent they've invested the money to get shovel ready, but shovel ready always leaves out a few that aren't quite shovel ready that need a little extra helping hand for some reason, and and so if you're going to be equitable about it, you really have to figure out a system by which you can reach out and help those most in need. And we don't, again, we don't have that. It's the state takes in the applications or funding they take in. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we, we need to be far more strategic and thoughtful about it. Terry, one of the difficulties I'm sure you guys have talked about is how to get all the local agencies on board and going in the same direction because we have other entities out there like the PRC, they're going to be critical in, in, in all these decisions. What's your sense of how able you're able to get everybody in the room, so to speak, and getting moving in the same direction in New Mexico? Well, I mean, that that all comes down to leadership. I mean, somebody mm -hmm. has to decide in the state they want to take this on and, and start leading on this issue because you're absolutely right. I mean, the PRC is kind of off doing its own thing. You know, the Environment Department's doing another. The Department of Finance Administration's doing another. Yeah. And the legislators are doing something with their capital outlay. And it really calls for somebody to wrangle all these cats and, and get them together to figure out how we're going to do this in the right way. I've seen that done in the past. I mean, prior administrations have figured that out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, you know, I, I understand we're in the middle of uh, a global pandemic. There's a lot of challenges right now. So infrastructure, again, might not get the attention it needs. But really, for the long term, it's the time is right now to set up the systems we need to start uh, planning more responsibly on this front. I got to say, on a bit of a side note, I'm not sure what your opinion on this might be, but it also seems to me, reading over this report, this is what begs a full-time legislature, <laughs> because what you've got going on here in this report cannot be chopped at in 60 or 90 days. It, it, it cannot. Not this amount of money, not this amount of decision making. I, I'm curious your, your opinion on that, I, or, or at least an ongoing uh, committee of some sort, interim committee yeah. at the least. There is some interim work, but, you know, clearly uh, we testified um, on four occasions with the Rural Economic uh, Task Force Interim Committee on this issue. And, you know, it's clear that legislators struggle um, understanding what's going on in infrastructure. They have a lot to worry about. And, and you're asking a part-time legislator to intricately know the infrastructure system, but also know our educational system. I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough challenge. And in the past, you used to have a few legislators that were experts that developed that expertise. Um, but we have a lot of new members, um, and I think they're still learning about how to confront this big issue. So, yeah, it definitely calls for a full-time legislature, probably more staffing as well, so that they can get, their, get a handle on these issues. It's the moment. It really is. Yeah. Hey, Terry Bruner, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us here on uh, our Usual Wednesday, noon-ish Wednesday Facebook Lives, and we appreciate your time, your effort, but especially the amount of work you and your team have put into this. I think, again, I'm going to say it again, I think it's a very important document that decision makers here really need to, to roll their sleeves up on, not just kind of breeze over it, but really kind of consider what you folks are saying here, because this could be the corner we need to take here. So, Terry, if we can catch up with you as time moves along and see how things are going, that'd be a great favor, actually. 
All right. Anytime, Gene. Thank you for the Absolutely. opportunity. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We will see you Friday night at 7 o'clock on Channel 5.1 for the regular show. And until then, the snow is still coming down wherever you may be. Be safe. Enjoy it. It's winter here in New Mexico. It's beautiful. We'll see you next time.